Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and today we're going to be doing a little bit of the basics of tree identification. So if you haven't had much of a chance to learn tree identification yet, or you just need to catch up on some of those basic skills that you might have missed, this is your chance. I have two field guides here with me. This one is my book, Peterson. I've had this book for 20 years. I've taken it with me on vacation. It's got excellent color photographs and descriptions of all kinds of trees and a lot of shrubs of the entire eastern United States, even South Florida. I also have with me this book, Whoop. Native, Common Native Trees of Virginia. This book is put out by the Virginia Department of Forestry. It's not very big, but it has almost every native tree that is common enough that you are likely to encounter it without, you know, going on a, on a deep dive someplace. This book is less than $5. I suggest that you call ahead to one of the offices that have them in stock and pick them up in person because the shipping is a bit much. But this book with its black and white drawings and simple to understand descriptions is really useful. Uh, this book also has in it a dichotomous key, which is a series of questions that you can ask about the tree you're looking at that will help guide you to the identification of that tree. Questions like what shape are the leaves or how big are the leaves. Most of the questions in this book are based on leaves because that is sort of the easiest entry point for most people. Now you may notice I picked um, not a great time of year to film this video. We do not have a whole lot of leaves to go by here today. In fact, early spring is one of the hardest times even for experienced um, tree identifiers because some of the other little things that you look for in winter have started to transition into spring. Uh, the buds which might have been distinctive are swelling and changing shape as they're getting ready to put out those leaves or they've just put out the leaves but they're really kind of too small to see and uh, some of the trees that will hold on to their fruit or seeds over the winter have let those go so not a great time to do this but uh, I'm fortunate we've got a classroom back in uh, Cheatham Hall here in Blacksburg where there are a lot of pressed leaves so we'll also be in there for some of the time and we'll be out here in the woods for some of the time because it's a beautiful spring day. Now, both the Petersons and the Common Trees of Virginia have in them some pictures that will help you to learn about the types of trees and the arrangements and shapes of leaves to help you use the book. And we'll go over a lot of these in this video. And then we get to the dichotomous key here in this book. So this first question in the dichotomous key is just, are the leaves needles and scales or are they broad and flat? So if they're needles or scales, you go to the second question and answer a lot more questions about conifers and their needles. Are they in groups? What are they like in cross section? Are they kind of squarish or flat or whatever? But if the leaves are broad and flat, then you skip all the way to question 14, where you start answering questions about those broad, flat leaves. How are they arranged? What are they shaped like? How big are they? Those kinds of things. And then every time you answer a question, you narrow down a little bit further until you get to the name of a tree. So you might have read that first question and thought, uh, scales or needles? What, what kind of a tree has scales? Well, here we have a red cedar. And you can see those tiny little, I mean, they look like scales. Those are the leaves of this red cedar tree. They've become so uh, small and specialized that they just look like scales. You'll find those on the true cedars as well as on the red cedar, which is in the juniper family. So here is a tree with needles. This is a small pine tree. And the needles of a pine tree are in little bundles. They aren't born singly on the stalk, but they're in little bundles called fascicles. Um, so some books will say bundle and some will use the more scientific term of fascicle. 
And different kinds of pine trees have different numbers of needles in those bundles. So in ca this case, this is a white pine and it has five needles per fascicle. But this is something that you'll want to look for. If the needles aren't in a bundle, it's not a pine. It's a spruce or a fir or something like that. So here we have another pine tree. So this is a tree that has needles instead of broad flat leaves. And those needles are in bundles or fascicles. But in this case, there are two needles per bundle. So we know that this is a different type of pine. Here's an example of a tree which has needles, but is not a pine. You can see that these needles are not in bundles. These needles are on the stem individually. This is a Norway spruce. It's not native, so you won't find it in the Native Trees of Virginia book, but it's a very commonly planted ornamental and even somewhat naturalized, especially up in Pennsylvania where I'm from. We had um, several of these planted in my yard growing up, and we used to tell people that uh, we lived in the house with all the big pine trees in front. And then I got a forestry education and learned that these were not actually pines, they were spruces. One of the first questions you're going to ask yourself about a broadleaf tree is whether the leaves and twigs are arranged oppositely or alternately. So this is a shrub here that is a good example of opposite arrangement. So you can see here that these two little twigs come off of the main stem directly opposite of each other. Here's another example of that, directly opposite of each other, opposite arrangement. Now sometimes they'll get broken off and it'll look like there's only one, but if you see, you know, where many of them or the majority of them are opposite, even if you occasionally get one without a partner, that means that this is an oppositely arranged tree or shrub. So that really narrows things down because there aren't that many native trees here in Virginia that have this opposite arrangement. Maples, ashes, and dogwoods, the mad group, Capifoliaceae, which is a group of shrubs, probably including this one here, and horse chestnut. So madcap horse. The other arrangement is called alternate. This black cherry is a really good example of alternate. You can see how the buds, which are going to turn into leaves, come off one side of the twig and then a little further up the other side and then a little further up back to the first side. So it alternates which side of the twig the leaf comes out or the smaller twig comes out. And this can be seen with the leaves, it can be seen with the smaller twigs, and it can be seen with the buds even in winter. So I have snuck into one of the classrooms here in Cheatham Hall. This is known as the Dendro classroom. It's where they teach dendrology or the study of trees. And you can see here that they have all of these wonderful samples of pressed leaves, sometimes including flowers, sometimes including fruits and nuts and anything that would help to identify a tree or tell you about it. So a room that houses this sort of tree or plant museum is called a herbarium. Um, and there's a whole science behind how these samples are prepared, how they're labeled. You can see this uh, sample here from Montgomery County, which is the county where Blacksburg and Virginia Tech is. This is a oak um, species. And you can see that uh, this was collected 44 years ago and is here perfectly preserved for us to look at. So once you've established opposite or alternate, one of the next questions you'll want to look at is whether the leaf is simple or compound. This is an example of a compound leaf. A compound leaf means that all of this is one leaf. It's compound because it's made up of many leaflets. That is as opposed to a simple leaf where each leaf is just a single blade attached to the main stem. You can tell that this is 
all one leaf because this is where it attaches to the main woody stem. This is where the bud was that all of this came out of. Usually this leaf stem, which in a compound leaf is called a rachis, will be green, twig will be brown, this will be soft and flexible, this will be more woody, and this is the bud where all of this came out. So this is a compound leaf. In this case, this is a black locust. So the leaf stem on a simple leaf is called a petiole. And this leaf came out of a bud that was attached to the main stem there. And there was a bud there and a bud a little further up there where these other leaves came out. This is a red bud. This is a shagbark hickory. So again, all of this is one leaf that was attached there. You can see the leaf scar and the bud for next year's leaf right there on the stem. So you know that all of this, there's no leaf scars, no buds along the rachis where the leaflets are attached. All of this came out of the bud that was there on the main stem. So this shagbark hickory is another example of a compound leaf. Both of these are called pinnately compound. Pinna is Latin for feather. I think this one's a little bit more obviously feathery, but what it means is that the, that the leaflets come off along a long central rachis. So here's the rachis, the leaflets come off along it, like a feather has a main vein. The other option is to be palmately compound, like a buckeye, where it's like the palm of your hand. There's a spot in the middle and the leaflets come off of it. We don't have an example of that here, but we will go over palmately lobed so you can see the difference between palmate and pinnate. Another question you're going to want to ask yourself about your broadleaf leaf blade is whether it has lobes or not. Lobes are parts that stick out from the rest of the leaf, the way that your ear lobe sticks out from the rest of your ear. You can see that on this leaf here, it has lobes, bits that stick out from the rest of the leaf. This is an oak leaf. Now, the space in between lobes is called a sinus. So here's the sinus. It's a hollowed out part, kind of like your sinuses are hollowed out areas inside your head. So wherever you have lobes, you have sinuses between the lobes. So here we have two different oak species. And both of these are examples of lobed leaves. You can see that this pin oak is in the red oak family. It has sharp pointed lobes. And the pin oak is especially known for having deep sinuses. This is an overcup oak. You can see that the lobes are rounded as they are in white oaks. And this has very shallow sinuses, not coming in very close to the midrib at all. While oaks are pinnately lobed, those lobes coming off either side of a midrib like a feather. The sweet gum is palmately lobed. So you can see all of those lobes come from a common spot in the center, like the fingers of your hand. Another question you want to ask yourself is about the margins of the leaf. The dogwood has a smooth margin to the leaf. There are no teeth along it. While the basswood has teeth. So this might be called toothed or serrated. Like a serrated knife has teeth on it. This elm 
You might even call doubly serrated or double toothed because you can see it's got little teeth along the big teeth. So these are all clues that can help you to answer the question of what tree you have. Well, that's all we have time for today. Come back in two weeks to hear Bill Whirl give us 15 minutes in the forest on frogs.